be on the exit. If you look at the sort of returns that have been generated by the equity markets, uh, you're talking about very strong double-digit real returns coming from the equity markets. We have a, a well-triangulated system of uh, research within um, our team. So I think they have navigated these waters before, so I think we can be quite confident that they will still come out of this, they will try to pass this down as much as we can, even though it should be said that we are talking about an environment of high inflation, so passing this down might be slightly challenging. Hello, welcome back with another episode of Market Insights Sri Lanka. I'm Tulja Young, your host for the day. Today, we have a very special guest on the show, Mr. Navid Majid, who is the Senior Vice President at Asia Securities, which is a leading investment firm in Sri Lanka, providing investment banking, equities, and wealth management services. Hello, Mr. Navid Majid. How are you doing? And doing good. Thank you for having me here. Thank you for being here with us. And first of all, my first question for you would be, equity markets have performed quite strongly in 2021. And we are very recently, we saw the ASPI breaking through the 11,000 mark and continues to push its all high time record. So would you like giving your thoughts on the market and how is it going so far? Yes, indeed. I think it's been quite an extraordinary performance uh, by the equity markets ever since the initial lockdowns were removed back in May 2020. And ever since then, we've seen the market uh, continuing on this upward trajectory. If you take 2021 uh, year-to-date performance of both the indices uh, up to mid-November, you'll see that the ASPI is up more than 60% and the S&P SL20 is up uh, close to 40%. Um, as a matter of fact, if you look at the ASPI performance in comparison to the global market uh, indexes, Sri Lanka actually ranks fourth in terms of global market performance. Now, this, I think, is quite um, commendable given the fact that we continue to operate in an environment where foreign investors continue to be on the exit. But on the other hand, we've seen the domestic individuals and the domestic institutions stepping up uh, to carry the mantle. So I think this is a very large positive, but also I think what's quite incredible is the sort of resilience we've seen coming from the market. Over the last year and a half, we've uh, had to contend with up to four lockdowns. And every time we saw a new wave coming up, we've seen the market selling out and we've seen a dip in the market. But I think if you look at the most recent uh, wave in August 2021, and I think it's fair to say that it was one of the most severe waves that we've had, even though the expectations was that the markets will see a dip, on the contrary, the market actually picked up and continued its momentum up. So it's been a, a, a brilliant rally so far and I think a quite a resilient one. Okay, moving on, just like you said. So there's a certain fear psychosis, right, created by the mainstream media and especially individuals on social media. And this has, um, in the past, created negative reaction from the investing public regarding the stock market and stock market activity. So what are your thoughts about it and how are you going to address this situation? Yes, I think this is a question, I think, ever since the ASPI has crossed the 9,000 mark. This is okay. a question we as analysts yeah. get a lot uh, from investors as to if the market is overheated. Is there going to be a correction in the market? Are we going to see a plunge in the market? And I think we've also seen a lot of negative sound bites uh, coming also from social media and uh, mainstream media. This statement is that the market is overvalued mm -hmm. or overheated, I, I, I wouldn't really put it for the market as a whole, but I would say maybe there are certain counters within the stock market that are probably overvalued and they've rallied uh, basically on not much of a strong fundamental ground. So rather than calling the entire market um, overvalued or overheated, I think there's certain stocks that you can call uh, being overvalued or overheated. Now, unfortunately, some of these stocks are illiquid, uh, mm -hmm. low free float um, counters, and they've taken a large weight uh, in the overall ASPI index calculation. Therefore, if you do see uh, a correction at some point in some of these counters that I mentioned, you may see the ASPI as a whole dropping. Um, but if you look at the market as a, as a whole, the ASPI actually trades at around 13.4 times PE as of uh, mid-November. 
Uh, now, if you look at this, like I mentioned, this has been boosted slightly by some of the illiquid counters. But if you exclude those, the market multiple will be lower than what it seems. And still, if you compare this multiple onto um, sort of like the MSCI Frontier Markets Index or the Emerging Markets Index, you will notice that the ASPI continues to trade at a discount. And even compared to some of the regional countries, so if you talk about countries like um, India, Vietnam, uh, Philippines or Thailand, uh, these countries trade close to 20 times or above. So in comparison, the ASPI still looks cheap. Now, usually when we bring up this regional comparison, it's multifaceted, it's debatable because usually the macro situation in these different countries are not the same. Uh, but I think the point to be noted here is that eventually if we do see uh, foreign investors looking at Sri Lanka as an investment uh, opportunity, the sort of cheap valuations we see will still be providing us quite a strong case for uh, foreign investors to come in. The second point as to why the market is not really overvalued is because of the strong earnings growth that we've seen in the market. Now, regardless of, uh, despite having had two lockdowns, what it seems like is that what we expect is that the ASPI will probably have a record high earnings in 2021. So this again justifies why the market multiples can be somewhat elevated. And the third point, I think, and this is a point that has been discussed quite a bit, is the interest rates. Um, so yeah, interest rates are still quite low. We are recovering from uh, record lows in interest rates. And generally, historically, if you look at it, interest rates and market multiples have had a negative relationship. Uh, and so we're still seeing, I mean, uh, in terms of bank FD rates still being at around the 5.5, 6% mark. So in this context, uh, the interest rates that we're seeing right now in the market still is well below the pre-COVID levels. Um, so that justifies why the market multiples can be elevated in this scenario. Um, and lastly, again, like I mentioned, it's not been a broad-based index pickup. The pickup in the index somewhat has been focused on some of the liquid counters, while some of the manufacturing and the logistics sector have also helped the index pick up. But what this tells us is also the fact that there is still um, opportunity for investors in some of the other sectors, cyclical sectors that have not yet moved. And especially given the fact that we are in an economic recovery, we can expect some of these cyclical sectors to also see a pickup. So I think overall there's still value for investors to be extracted from the equity market. So to answer your question, I don't think the market is overvalued or overheated at this point. There's still uh, a lot of you know reasons for the market to continue moving up. So you mentioned illiquid counters. So does this mean that ASPI does not present an accurate representation of the market sentiment? I think to a large degree, yes. I think investors also have come uh, a long way to realize this. Like I mentioned, illiquid counters tend to have a large weight on the index at this point. And so we've seen a lot of volatility come into the market as a result. So when I say volatility, you're seeing certain days, the market's starting well in the negatives and ending in the positives, or starting with a very large cap up and ending in the negatives. So if you look at the standard deviation numbers of the ASPI, you'll notice that uh, the volatility we see in the ASPI is actually one of its highest levels in line with what we've seen during the times of war. So I think this, this is, uh, this is uh, a, a point of concern, but I think the CSC also have taken steps in the right direction. Recently, they had a, a board meeting on the 15th of November where they approved a change in the calculation methodology for the ASPI. So I think uh, when that comes on board right now, the ASPI is being calculated based on 100% of the issued share capital, uh, the, the market cap on that. Uh, for both the voting and the non-voting shares. So this does not factor in the tradable, the, the public float portion of, uh, of the stocks. So going forward from January 2022, the markets, the ASPI calculation methodology will move from, uh, from what it is right now to a free float adjusted market cap basis. So this will uh, avoid any major volatility that we see in the index. So I think this is a step in the right direction which should reduce the sort of volatility that we're currently seeing in the market. All right. Thank you very much. And we would like to move into a break now. And we'll be back, right back at it again.
welcome back. We are at a conversation today with our guest, Mr. Navid Majid. And now we'll be moving on to our next question, which is about the elusive investor, investors in the current rally, which are the foreign investors. And they have not just stayed out of the market, but they have also been net sellers. So do you think our stock market or stock market activity can thrive without the foreign investors? Yes, I think that's a good question. If you look at what I mentioned earlier also, we are still continue to operate in a market where foreign investors continue to remain on the exit. So foreign investors accounted for about 44% of the market activity back in 2018. But now in 2021, they account for mid-single digit uh, level activity in the market. On the other hand, the domestic individuals who accounted for about 20 to 25% of the market activity back in 2018, now accounts for about 60% of the market activity. So I think this is, I think, a very large uh, positive in the sense that whatever the foreign selling we've seen come through uh, has been absorbed uh, by the domestic investors. So as a matter of fact, like you rightly mentioned, uh, foreign outflows for the year have been close to 104 billion in 2021. Now, there have been a few reasons why foreigners uh, have been exiting, and I think the exit started off with the ending of the initial lockdowns. So the first reason why foreigners actually were looking to exit was Sri Lanka was one of those, one of the few stock markets globally where during that extended lockdown between the March to May period, our stock markets were closed. So during this period, even if foreign investors wanted to sell out or pull out of the market, they did not have the opportunity to do so. So this um, tampered uh, the, the, the sort of sentiments um, on the market. However, uh, since then, I think the CSC has made sure that the market will not be closed for extended periods going forward. And we saw this in the, the waves that followed, even though we've had lockdowns since, um, the market has continued to trade uninterrupted. So I think this is a very positive step by the CSC. The, on the um, other hand, another reason for foreign investors to exit uh, the Sri Lankan market comes from uh, most of the macro indicators deteriorating. So in recent times, we've seen uh, rating downgrades that have come towards the country. So I think this has also dampened uh, the sort of investor sentiment of investing in Sri Lanka. And I think the last, uh, last point as to why foreign investor sentiment is at this point a little dampened is mainly because uh, one of the reasons is that the currency has been set at a moral situation level of around the 200 mark. Um, so at this point, um, if a foreign investor looks to invest in the country at the current exchange rate, but believes that the currency should depreciate further, uh, they believe that there is a risk in investing into the country at this point because a sudden depreciation will erode into their investment returns. So these are some of the key, key reasons as to why foreigners uh, have been on the exit. But um, I think to your question earlier, I think um, it's, it's the, the domestic uh, individuals and the institutions have stepped up quite strongly. In our view uh, of Asia Securities Research, we think that um, the local investors will continue to be the ones carrying the mantle into 2022. Right. So as you know, um, social media plays a massive role, especially among the youngsters. And there are stock ma about the stock market, right? There are tips and advices that circulate around, the so around social media. Do you think there's certain weightage to this? And do you think these should be taken into consideration? Absolutely. I think that's a very interesting point yeah. that you uh, bring up. The social media and its influence on stock market is not, not a phenomenon that we're seeing just in Sri Lanka. I think it's a global phenomenon that we're seeing the sort of impact social media is having on um, investment decisions, not just in the equity markets, but also in digital currency, the crypto market, all of that. So I would say it uh, investors should not turn a blind eye to what's going on in social media. I think it's, it's very important uh, to have a good understanding of what's being um, discussed in social media. Uh, because at the end of the day, when you're investing in the equity markets, having very strong information, uh, information is gold, pretty much, investing in the equity markets. But it does come down to uh, the investor filtering and uh, ensuring that the information that they take from social media is right and timely. Uh, and that whoever who is putting this information out uh, has some amount of credibility, is coming from a background of making the right calls historically. So I think these are things that uh, investors uh, should keep an eye out for, but they should not be misled 
by uh, certain maybe social media posts that you might see. So here I think in this case it's important while you follow social media, have a good understanding of where the sentiments are for the investors to also educate themselves in their research capabilities. And that way they can do their own research before coming to an investment decision while also uh, relying on what's been uh, spoken about in social media. With that being said, in the recent rally, especially amongst the new generation of investors, they're trading in shares based on technical analysis. And these analyses are actively shared on social media, forums, and most of these are not generated by the traditional research houses. Do you use them and how do you recommend that one uses them and how do you recommend that one's careful and navigate through these reports? So technical analysis, like you rightly said, I think it's been widely used in social media platforms these days. Yeah. We at Asia Securities Research put a much higher weightage on fundamental research, on understanding the company, understanding the growth aspects, the risk aspects, um, and the profitability aspects of a company. So that's more fundamental research. I think for an investor, um, having a combined knowledge of both fundamental research and the technical is a very strong combination to investing in the markets. Uh, but here again, uh, just like I mentioned before, I think they should uh, educate themselves on how these charts should be read um, and should have a very objective and an unbiased view when it comes to some of these technical charts. So usually sometimes a company might be fundamentally strong, but it might not necessarily mean that the stock price might immediately move because the market sentiments might not be there on that stock. Um, so having a good knowledge of technical analysis uh, might be very useful when deciding if a stock has been oversold or if the stock is going to, if, see, if a stock is seeing a lot of accumulation, if it's going to break out. So there are advantages to uh, using technical analysis, but I think we put a lot of weight on fundamental uh, research because at the end of the day, if your company is uh, fundamentally strong and is going to see growth in the future, the chances that you may lose your investment is very low. On the other hand, a technical analysis can be done on any company, whether it's fundamentally strong or not. So investors need to pay very close attention to it, but I think it's uh, important to have a good understanding of fundamental research while also backing your investment calls with technical analysis. Right. So Sri Lanka is dominated by savings and a fixed deposits culture. Right. But if you look right across India, almost every household has investments and they start having stocks from a very young age. Why isn't this the culture here and why haven't we been able to make share investments a preferred investment vehicle? That's a good question and I think uh, the Sri Lankan community I think uh, predominantly has been a risk averse investing community. So generally if you take, if you look at households, um, like you rightly said, they might look more towards the fixed income um, asset class for their returns. But I think right now at this juncture in our, uh, in, in our economy, yeah. um, I think financial uh, literacy is going to play a crucial part in an individual or a household securing their future financial, uh, their wealth. So I think that's a very important part. And just to give an example as to what I mean here, um, usually given the conservative sort of investment style that we've seen by many individuals and in looking at FDs, um, having invested in FDs over the last one and a half years, you're probably looking at returns of about 5 to 6% uh, from fixed income. And this means an individual would have lost out on the strong double digit and even sometimes triple digit returns that we've seen in the equity markets. So I think individuals need to educate themselves a lot, improve their financial literacy here because we are right now in an environment where we're probably going to see inflation picking up quite strongly. In this context, just to give you an example, if uh, an investor has 100,000 rupees probably invested in an FD, they probably get 5 to 6 percent. But on the other hand, we expect inflation to pick up quite strongly. The central bank has said that their near-term inflation targets will deviate from their, uh, or rather near-term inflation will deviate from their targets. So you're talking about high single-digit uh, inflation in the near term and we expect this to even go into double-digit inflation sometime next year given that most of the price controls have been removed on uh, food products and non-food products. So in this context, if you invest 100,000 in a bank, 
you might make five or six thousand in a year. Whereas on the other side, inflation is at seven, eight, nine percent. So your cost of living is going up at a faster pace. So in a sense, by keeping your money at the banks, you might be losing out in real terms. So this is something that we need to educate uh, the public about, the individuals about. Investing in the stock market in this uh, regard, the stock market has prov provided very strong double-digit real returns. So I think um, educating, the, educating the individuals is, is, is a very important part and I think the CSC and SAC have also been quite active on social media trying to educate uh, the public uh, in this regard. And we at Asia Securities Research also will be launching our financial literacy program in due course very soon across multiple platforms and it will be free of charge for public to access and it will be across all three languages. So I think it's a very critical part like I mentioned uh, at this juncture in our economy. Thank you very much and with that being said we'll be moving on to our second break and to the viewers at home make sure you like, subscribe and turn on your post notifications. We'll be right back. from Market Inside Sri Lanka in conversation with Mr. Navid Majid and now we are drilling down to the stock market discussion um, talking about when measuring the share market investments investors have been ignoring dividend yielding stocks such as CTC, Netsle. These have been yielding more than the fixed deposit rates and the stock prices have been steady. What is preventing investors from looking at this lucrative but steady income option? Like you rightly said, Teruja, I think we have uh, companies that are giving very strong double-digit uh, dividend yields in this market and that's well above uh, FD rates that we, are, that we are seeing. I think it's wrong to say that investors are ignoring these stocks altogether. Mm -hmm. I think there are still long-term investors who do have uh, long positions in, in some of these stocks. But there's no reason for an investor to really ignore these stocks because they're, if they are able to pay strong dividends in a sense it means that the company is also performing quite strongly so there's no reason for investors uh, to particularly i think ignore these stocks but i think what has probably happened here is more in terms of the opportunity cost because you've seen certain other uh, sectors certain other counters moving at much faster rates um, so instead of looking at the dividend yield in this case the opportunity cost would be quite high if there is no share price appreciation seen in some of these shares so instead, we believe that maybe investors are looking more towards the more lucrative, fast-moving stocks in this regard. But I think I'll, I'll repeat my point again. I don't think that these uh, stocks need, should be ignored. They are fundamentally quite strong, and that's the reason they are able to distribute shareholder returns at, at such high levels. Right. So talking about the current situation, we are is facing a post-COVID economic challenge, and especially in the form of stress on our foreign exchange reserves and the currency with the rupee sliding to 200 against the USD. Will that be detrimental to the performance of the listed companies and also to the performance of the stock market? Like I, I think like, like you rightly mentioned, uh, Teluja, I think uh, there is a lot of pressure on our currency. Like I mentioned before, there's a moral suasion level of 200 and the, the currency, there is a likelihood of the currency depreciating further. Um, now, for an investor in the stock market, it will make sense for them to hedge their investments by looking at investing into companies, predominantly uh, USD revenue generating companies. By doing that, if there is any sort of depreciation in the currency that you see, this will benefit uh, the top lines of these companies and they will see an FX gain. So that's one way that investors uh, can actually hedge against a depreciating rupee in the stock market by investing into USD-based companies. But on the contrary, I don't think it's a, it's a major reason to be selling down some of the local manufacturing companies or most of the other counters that are net importers of uh, products. Even though, yes, you're going to see maybe an impact on their margins because of the currency depreciation, these companies we need to keep in mind have been around for some time and they've been through several cycles. They've been through uh, cycles of currency depreciation. So I think they have navigated these waters before. So I think we can be quite confident that they will still come out of this. They will try to pass this down as much as we can, even though it should be said that we are talking about an environment of high inflation. So passing this down might be slightly challenging. I think what we need to keep in mind is we have 
uh, been through currency depreciation in the past. There might be a near term impact to certain corporates, but I think eventually they will be able to navigate these uh, waters. Right. I'm sure the viewers at home would like to know your thoughts about the recent budget reading and the impact on the stock market this year. Yes, so I think uh, Asia Securities Research, is, we've taken a neutral view as for the impact of the budget uh, on the stock markets. And uh, even right after the budgets, the immediate uh, trading day after that, we saw uh, the markets seeing an immediate reaction to some of the policies that were passed. But it uh, immediately saw a rebound. So the reason we take a neutral approach is because I think the government has tried to maintain most of its tax policies where they are. Some of the key positives are that the corporate taxes which were cut back in January 2020 are still maintained. So I think this continues to be favorable. In the past, we've seen in the last one and a half years, we've seen the manufacturing sector being one of the uh, strongest performing sectors. And so any policies related to protecting the domestic firms in this regard was unchanged in this budget. So that's again a positive for the manufacturing sector. So this is a sector that again we believe will continue to perform quite strongly. Um, and so I think if you look at the budget, I think the most notable uh, items were a one-off tax surcharge of 25%. Now there's still a lot of clarity that needs to come uh, in this regard. but. Um, what you need to keep in mind is that this is sort of like a super gains tax that was implemented back in 2015 um, and it will be a one-off impact on the companies. So it does not really change the recurring earnings of these companies or the thesis for these companies. So there will be a one-off impact but again it's yet to be seen as to how this will come uh, into play. Um, but if it is sort of spread across a few quarters you might not see the impact being all that high. Or if it's just a balance sheet impact like it's been in 2015, then you're not going to see a profitability impact again. Um, you, we also saw a 2.5% social security contribution charge. So this um, is a pass-through tax just like the NBT we've had before. Uh, so it's very likely that you might see most of these corporates passing down this 2.5% down to the end customer. So there might not be again a major impact on a major impact on the corp at a corporate level. Um, so overall, these were the two notable, I would say, uh, impacts that the budget had across all of the counters in the market. Um, so uh, with that in mind, we don't see a major impact to corporate performance. And so for that reason, we think that the equity markets should still remain strong. What is your view on equities as an asset class going further? Just like equities has been, I think, the preferred asset class over the last year and a half, um, if you look at the sort of returns that have been generated by the um, equity markets, uh, you're talking about very strong uh, double-digit real returns coming from the equity markets. Whereas some of the other asset classes such as uh, fixed income, uh, currency, gold, uh, and even real estate in real terms have not really generated as strong real rates um, over the last year and a half. So equities has been the most preferred asset class and I think even going forward uh, in the near term we think that equity markets will be uh, will remain the preferred asset class. Uh, and the reason I'm telling you this is I think um, uh, like I mentioned before we are, we are in an in environment where we are going to see a sharp rise in inflation. We expect inflation to be high single digit levels by the end of this year and then move more towards the double digit levels sometime next year. In the meantime, the central bank has spoken about trying to maintain the interest rates at around these levels in order to not stifle growth. So in that regard, fixed income is still going to probably give you very low real returns or even negative real returns. So in the near term, we think that with the sort of inflation pressure that you're going to see, the equity markets no doubt is going to be the investment or the asset class that is going to give you the strongest returns. But on the other hand, if you take a more medium to long term uh, view on this, if you look at the budgets uh, that we discussed earlier, if you take a step back and look at the budgets, you'll see that based on our analysis, we think that the trade deficit is going to continue to grow um, in over the next uh, coming few quarters. Uh, so to this regard, what we think is that there is going to be more government borrowing that's going to come into play. Uh, and so interest rates also can see a much sharper pickup sometime later next year. So in the near term, uh, so with that happening, if interest rates start to see a much uh, sharper pickup, then you're going to see uh, fixed income as an asset class uh, starting to become more attractive. But that's more on the medium to long term. 
Um, in the near term, I think we, we still remain quite positive on the equity markets. That's the place to be for you to get your strong double digit real returns. Uh, but in the medium to long term, fixed income is uh, going to eventually be uh, somewhat more competitive as an asset class. Some time back, criticism was placed on the valuation of research reports, where there was a crash predicted, but however, the opposite took place. How are you addressing this criticism? So I think your question, Thuraj, I think can be broken into two. I think we can talk about valuations and calls that were done uh, by, I think, the, the, the all research houses as a whole on, on companies or on the market as a whole. Uh, so at a company level, I think majority of the research houses, they... Uh, tend to take fundamental uh, approach to valuations and we at Asia Securities Research also take a very fundamental way to valuing, valuing companies. Uh, so in terms of how we go about this, I think it's very important to understand first the sort of methodology we go through to make these calls and how these calls are made. So generally, we at Asia Securities Research, we take a top-down approach where we start uh, with analyzing the macro environment from which we come down to a sector level analysis and then we come down to the company level analysis. And also we take a bottom up approach which is where we start from a company level to the sector and to the macro level. So we take, uh, we, so by doing this we have a well triangulated system of research within um, our team. Now when you talk about company specific uh, methodology for valuations, we look at uh, quite a few factors. So I think uh, some of the key factors that we look at for a company are the growth factors for a company, the risk factors for a company, the profitability for the company, and also the valuations. So these are some of the main factors based on which we analyze a company before giving a call on this. We have detailed financial models built on these companies, detailed industrial models built on these companies. And so uh, there's a lot of, uh, in terms of a process, in terms of talking to industry participants, talking to the company management to get a good understanding. Um, so based on these, we tend to forecast the future potential of the company. We factor these into the estimates and eventually use a valuation methodology to arrive at a value. And based on this valuation, we write our investment note, which is generally published uh, out to the investor community. Now, there are generally risks that are placed uh, when we put out a particular call. And uh, this is something that we take a lot of, you know, we are quite careful to make sure we mention to uh, investors in our investment notes as to what the risks that are involved are. So based on these risks and based on some of these factors coming into play, there can be a revision of our target price either upwards or downwards. So those are some of the reasons why sometimes due to a particular risk playing out uh, after a particular call that we put out, the company may have underperformed uh, or performed below our expectation or there might be an upside potential that we also highlighted due to which the company can do better than our expectations. So those risks are something that, uh, you know, uh, the, the risks and the, the downside risks and the upside uh, potential is both things that we mention in our reports which in case one of those happens, it can miss our estimates or surprise us our, on our estimates. So that is at a company level, I think um, that's, that's how we approach, take uh, the approach to our research. Uh, and in terms of markets, so I think um, the, the point here is I think we've seen certain reports coming out saying that the market might correct uh, after a particular point and that it might come down. So when you're looking at a market level uh, analysis, I think um, what's kind of happened here is that I think there was a bit of underestimation when it came to the impact or sort of the low interest rate environment that has had on the sort of market performance. Um, so like I mentioned early in our, in our conversations, in the current situation, it might not necessarily make sense for you to look at the 10-year historic average because we are operating in a different environment where we're seeing record high earnings, we're seeing uh, record low interest rates we've seen. Um, so these are some of the factors for which the market multiple can be much higher than what you have seen in the past. Uh, and so when you do research and try to compare them to historical multiples, they might not necessarily be the right comparison in this case. And that's probably one of the reasons why certain market calls have uh, missed uh, over the last few months. Uh, so just to give you an example of uh, what I mean by uh, us pointing out what the risks are when we give out an investment case. If you take a company that's, let's say, operating in a regulated environment. Um, so I think very recently we've had 
the cement industry, which has been under regulated pricing. We've had the LPG uh, industry that's been under regulated pricing. And so even though we might put our estimates out, we might clearly put out a disclaimer there that says that given that the company is operating under regulated pricing, a possible depreciation in the currency will be uh, will negatively impact the company. Uh, so this is something that investors need to keep in mind that when we put that there, that a likely happening of or occurrence of that event can negatively impact the earnings. Um, so it's important that we uh, make sure that we put our investment thesis out, but also make sure we mention that the risks that are involved in there. Um, so I think that's some of the reasons why maybe in the past some of these, um, some of them might have not uh, performed above our estimates or below our estimates. With that being said, we have reached the end of our interview. Thank you very much for being here with us today. And to the viewers at home, thank you for sticking throughout this video. We hope you enjoyed it. Make sure you like, comment, subscribe, and turn on your post notifications. Stay safe, stay tuned, stay connected with Market Insights Sri Lanka.